All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome back. I think um, for some of you, maybe uh, you already came for a webinar session yesterday. Yesterday was about Kafka 101. So this month is a bit special where we have two webinar sessions covering two technical, two totally different technical topics that also relate to a bit to the GDG, uh, to Google ecosystem, uh, the GCP ecosystem. So uh, today, uh, our guest speaker for today is uh, Derek Wong. I think he appeared uh, a couple of times already. I think this should be his like, third time, I, I, if I believe. Uh, and he'll be covering on uh, Spring Boot apps on uh, Kubernetes. So let me bring him onto the stage. Hello, Hello Derek. Hi. Yes, good, uh, Hi, good to see you again. Nice to be here. All right. Uh, let me switch over to your slides, and then after that, the stage is all yours. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll remove myself. Okay. Um, thank you, Henry. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Derek again. Um, I am the tech practice specialist um, specialized in app organization in Google. And then today's topic. Uh, it's about Spring Boot application and uh, on Kubernetes. Um, the reason why I came up with this topic is because I thought, well, um, if you're a Java developer um, and if you're building new application, there are um, very big chance that you're going to use Spring Boot. It is um, the most popular um, Java development framework or tools, right? So I thought, why not talk about Spring Boot application specifically for um, Spring Boot running on Kubernetes because they're uh, a little bit, um, you know, kind of um, best practice or guideline that I can provide. So that's why I came up with this topic. So today I'm going to talk about um, and I'm going to demo a little bit on the Spring Boot on Kubernetes. I'm going to talk about the um, um, microservices framework from Spring, um, the Spring Cloud, Spring Cloud Discovery, Spring Cloud Config Server, Spring Cloud History, and what about running them on Kubernetes. And then I'm going to talk about Istio as well, which is um, the most popular um, service mesh on Kubernetes. So we'll talk about how to use Istio to simplify the Spring Boot applications development, especially for microservices. Right, so let's start today. And um, I have a few slides, not many, and then I'm going to switch between the slides and the demo. I'm going to do some live coding as well. So, hope oh, you all enjoy. Right, so yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the Docker file uh, or will be the Spring Boot application packaging. As you know, in Kubernetes, you have to use container image, and then very likely you're going to use Docker file. Um, we're going to talk about that, um, the pros and cons, and if there's any alternative. And as mentioned, I'm going to talk about a few um, framework that are um, very popular. If you develop microservices on or using Spring Boot, you're probably using Spring Cloud, Discovery, config history, and dispute tracing. And I'm going to talk about uh, actuator as well. Um, for Spring Boot applications running on Kubernetes, we, uh, there will be a, a little bit um, of uh, you know, things that you may want to know. Okay, first, the Docker file. This is, I mean, if you're familiar with um, applications development for Kubernetes, this is not new. Um, this is a file that we're going to use it to um, to package your Spring Boot application um, and then to, uh, to build a container image. And then you can put the container image in a um, container registry like Docker Hub or in Google Cloud, you can put it in container registry or the new artifact. Which is true. So this is the um, most simple Docker file for Spring Boot application. As you can see, 
only four lines. Um, the first is the um, base image, right? Inherit from the base image, from the open JDK base image, and then um, define the variable called jar file, right? Which is um, help you to specify the target jar file, and then copy the jar file to the um, um, corresponding location, and then the entry point, which is the command that you want to execute your applications. As you know, Spring Boot, um, one of the biggest benefit, as I see from Spring Boot, is that um, self-contained, right? So um, if you package your application, your Spring Boot application into a jar file, basically it contains most of the stuff you're going to need. It's contain all your class file that you build, contain the um, uh, the the sublet runtime if you're building um, sublet application, right? For example, if you can embed the Tomcat sublet container um, into the Java file, right? So a single artifact, right? You can deploy to anywhere you want, and then you just need a JDK to execute the um, application, right? It's as simply as Java um, dash jar and then your application Java path, then your applications together with the applications runtime, the Tomcat, um, is started, right? Very, very simple. You don't really need a um, another application server Right, you don't need to deploy to the application server to start the service, etc. Right, it's as simple as that. Um, so, but there, if you're running a lot of application, a lot of Spring Boot application, um, especially on Kubernetes, um, there might be some other stuff, especially you're running them. In the production environment, right? There may be another stuff that you need to worry. Um, for example, the base image is one thing. Um, especially if you're working in a big enterprise like a bank, usually they have a list of approved base image, or someone else in the bank, they will uh, the job. Part of their job is to approve or tune um, the base image and make it available for the developer. So that means someone in the bank need to care about the base image. Uh, for example, they need to patch the base image, um, and then they need to provide the patched version for the developer so that they can build the new Docker image again once it is updated. So someone need to worry about this base image. And then, um, as you can see in this Docker file, there is, um, it is very simple. Of course, if you run in a production environment, you can, there are actually lots of parameters that you can um, specify. For example, you can specify the maximum pip size here right in this entry point command right this is something you can do but what about um when you run that container in kubernetes so your container in kubernetes the i mean the memory assigned to that container is actually specified in that in a kubernetes um, deployment file and um, if you change, if you need more memory for that application, you change that. You need to change two things, right? You need to change the Kubernetes deployment file. And you also need to change this container image to make it effective, right? So um, it's not that easy to, you know, scale up. Scale out is easier, just add more, um, you know, increase the number of instance for that deployment or replica set. But if you want to scale up, adding more memory, um, it will be job of the developer to um, change 
uh, something like image. Or you can, of course, you can externalize the hip size, for example, to some other parameters and then you inject it in, um, you know, using environment variable. That's also possible, but um, I mean, there are uh, not that easy, not just four lines, um, especially when you run that application in a production environment. A lot of that you need to consider. So today I'm going to introduce you an alternative of Docker file. Um, it's called BuildPack. If you're familiar with um, with um, Heroku or some platform as a service, for example, Cloud Foundry, right? um, they have embedded BuildPack support. And then BuildPack is now a separate project. It is a CNCF project. And then everyone um, can use BuildPack to build their container image without Docker file. Right? It supports lots of a lot of you know um, different languages, including Java, Node.js, um, Python, etc. Right? The most common programming languages are supported, including .NET like Core. Right. So and then I forgot since which version. Maybe Spring Boot two point three. Um, it's come with the um, build pack included in the Maven plugin so that you can build the container image um, using the using Maven command. So why not I do a little demo to show you guys um, how to use the build pack to build your container image. So if you're familiar with Spring Boot, um, this is not new to you, the Spring Initializer, which is a very good portal to bootstrap an application. So let's create a, a new application and then going to add some simple dependency like the web and then the actuator that we're going to use it later. And then click generate. Open up my IDE and then open the project. One second, it's coming. So, um, I'm going to do some live coding, very simple one. Um, I'm going to create a very simple West controller, uh, Hello World, and then I'm going to show you how to build the uh, container image. Okay, so why not I this file so let me zoom in. yeah all right so let me add a rest controller and then just say it's very simple and point say hi mapping um, hello. Right, that's it. Why
So let me try to run Mesa. Run to see if it work. So if you use Spring Boot before, there's a Nathan plugin allow you to run the application um, before you build it. So that's the command. Just use Nathan Spring Boot run. And then as you can see, the application is up, and then um, it's on there's a embedded Tomcat server and running on port eighty eighty. And then you see that that's, it is started successfully. And then if you try, let's try to send some very simple command. See if that working. Yeah, it's working. So as you can see, the hard easy GPG. So it's working. Now we need to build a um, container image, right? Instead of using the Docker file, we use the build pack. Um, as you can see here, Spring Boot. Um, I think it's built in. Yeah. It is a another Maven command called Spring Boot Build Image. It will use the build pack to build a container image without any Docker file. You can see there's no Docker file in this folder, and then it's now pulling the builder and the um, build packs to build the image. So the build packs um, it come with a pack of build pack, right? Including the Java build pack, including .NET Core, including Node.js, Python, etc. So the builder will try to use um, all the build packs to first scan the project. As you can see, there's a detecting phase, which is used to determine which build pack to use for building the Docker image. Um, so if it is a Java project, for example, if it is Maven or Gradle, right, then build pack will use the builder will use the Java build pack to build this project. If it is a .NET Core project, then the builder will use the um, .NET Core build pack for building the container image. So you don't need to worry about which build pack to use. It is automatically um, detected and selected. Right? And then it start building right now. <clears throat> It's creating different layers. Um, and then there's something I want to show you. Yeah, build is successful. Something more. I'm not sure. Yeah. So build pack also help to inject some um, dependency into the um, application. For example, this is one called memory calculator, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you define, when you define the Docker file, if you don't specify anything, we use the default heap size. And uh, if you need to scale up the application, you actually need to change a few things before it is effective. But with build pack, build pack automatically inject the memory calculator, and then when the Java um, applications in bootstrap, it will um, use this memory calculator to determine the heap size to use, right? So that you can um, easily scale up your um, applications, right? You can double the memories, um, double the heap size for the applications easily just by just changing the Kubernetes deployment without changing the Docker image, without changing anything. Right. As simple as that. So this is some of the value-added um, um, dependency uh, allow you to you know <clears throat> um, allow your container image be easily you know scale up, scale down, etc. So the image 
Spirit and check. The image. Yeah, this is the one just built. If I run, I run this using this command. As you can see, the first one is calculating the JVM memory, like space on that um, available memory, and then determine the heap size. So you don't need to calculate that itself, and then it will be easily scanned. But the application is up. Simple. Now, <clears throat> um, so yeah, so that's build pack. Um, that's um, the Nathan plugin with the build pack. But you may ask, um, what if you build what if your application is not Spring Boot? Or what if you want to centralize the image building process? You don't want the developer to build the container image in his own laptop. Or you may have some you know, governance, some policy in your company, like a bank. They have lots of policy, right? They, they, they want to use a specific base image, as I mentioned earlier, right? So, um, this Maven, Maven plugin may not be able to satisfy some of these policy or requirements. Um, then you may want to have a central location. Maybe um, it is embedded into the CI CD process. So once you commit the source code, then you want to use build pack in a server to build the container image with some specific um, base image, right? You, there, you, there, there, there are some other options, right? Instead of using the Maven plugin, you can use the pack command line to do that. Okay. This is the command line. Pack means build pack. So you can use pack to build it. Um, this is a simple command. Pack, build, and then the name of your image, and then you can specify the builder here. And the builder, you can create your own builder. By creating your own builder, you can specify the base image to use. You can specify what, what's the build pack you want to use or you allow the developer to use, right? You can embed this script into your CICD process, right? Like you can use Jenkins to call the script, right? So then Jenkins server uh, will help you to build the container image automatically. Or if you're running your applications, if you're having your CICD process in Google Cloud, you don't need this, right? We have an even more simple solution for that, which is called Cloud Build. So you can use the gcloud builds command So that you don't need to, you know, you don't need to change your CI/CD process. You don't need to change your Jenkins server or Argo CP server to include um, the image building step. Right? You can simply use cloud builds and submit, and then use the pack parameter and then specify the output image. You can specify it as a um, Google container registry location. So why not I run and show you. And then you don't need to set up the you know Docker daemon. You know, if even if you're running the Maven plugin or the pack CLI, you need a Docker daemon. You need the Docker desktop if you're running on the laptop or in your server, you need the Docker in, um, to have to build the container image. But with the cloud build, right, with one simple command, it help you to upload your source code into the cloud build server, right? And then it help you to build the container image automatically, right? Um, and then you don't need to manage anything. You don't need to manage the worker node, you don't need to manage the Docker daemon, the pack, CLI, 
after things um, automated. Right. And then one last thing about the build pack um, I haven't showed you is remember we talked about this. Remember that so one of the advantage of Spring Boot is the capability of building one single Java that includes everything, right? And very, very often the Java is very big, especially your applications is big, right? The Java is very, very big because it's contain all the dependencies. So if you use this Docker file to build a container image, right? The container image um, is definitely big, but the worst is you will have a lot of different version because your application is evolving. You have version one, two, three, four, five to 10. And then if you use a single jar, single fat jar, all of your um, container image will be hundreds of megabytes. And the problem is it will be slower to start your application. And then it will use up a lot of um, storage, for example. There's another option. Instead of using the jar, the fat jar, I'm not sure if you are aware. When I build a container image using the build pack, I not using I haven't really packaged the jar file. The build pack actually read all of my source code and then create the um, container image. And then build pack, the current build pack will use a layering automatically. Meaning if your version one container uh, image, hundred of megabytes, and then the second version, you just change a few, few lines of code. You'll see that difference, right? Because you're not using the single fat jump using layer. And the version two, can relate a lot of layer to the previous um, version so that the only difference is that the delta the few line of code difference so the storage requirement will be much lower and the amount of time for kubernetes to run your version 2 container image will be much quicker because kubernetes doesn't need to download the big Java game. I just download the thin layer. So um, that's also the benefits of using the pack. All right. Um, yeah. So the GCal command just finished building the um, computer image. Why not I show you here in the Google Cloud console? So if we search Cloud Build, you will see the um, management plane and then yeah and then you see this bill it's the one I just downloaded so all the log can be found here right the bill pack logs can be found here and then yeah if there's anything wrong you can do the troubleshooting using this um, concept. But I'm going I'm not going to show you live by live. Um, I think that's it for build pack. <clears throat> right, so um, if you haven't tried it, uh, please do try it. It's really really convenient and then also help you to save the storage, help you to speed up the deployment, right? quite lots of benefits. Okay. So then, um, talking about Spring Boot, um, so I believe a lot of you, if you use Spring Boot, you may be building microservices. Talking about microservices, I need to mention this framework called Spring Cloud Netflix, um, which is a project, uh, I think six or seven years ago, maybe six years ago that the Spring team start um, to replicate the Netflix microservices framework in the Spring ecosystem. So um, Netflix actually start building this microservices framework um, by themselves. 
lots of, um, I think, seven years ago. Um, at that time, there's no Kubernetes available, there's no container platform available. They um, built their microservices and run on um, VM, virtual machines, not container. And then they, they faced lots of challenges. For example, service discovery, for example, config management, for example, cascade failure, and then distributed tracing. So they um, solved lots of these challenges and then they built their own framework. And then when the Spring team saw that framework, they thought, oh, it's a great idea. Why not integrate them into the Spring ecosystem? And that's why um, they came up with this framework called Spring Cloud Discovery, Spring Cloud Config, Spring Cloud History, and Spring Cloud Tracing. So all these um, framework are built to solve the microservices challenge um, for um, so to replicate the Netflix, uh, Netflix way and then integrating into this into Spring. Um, so I'll go through them one by one from discovery to tracing. So Netflix called the discovery server, um, Eureka server. Um, Eureka is the Latin version of um, discovery, it means discovery. So Eureka server is a, um, it's like a, it's a little bit like the DNS, right? It's for the um, service name and the location of the service. So as you can see in this diagram, the service consumer need to call the service provider, which is a remote service. Um, so instead of using the IP address or the URL of the service provider, right? Netflix want to use a more dynamic name for that. The reason is simple because they were building microservices, right? And then um, they were using cloud environment. So the, um, and then they, they also adopt the um, kind of, I'm not sure if you guys heard about the pet versus cattle. Um, so they treat the machines, the server, like a cattle instead of pet. So the server actually can up and down very quickly, right? They can scale out very quickly. That means there's no static IP address, right? They need something more dynamic. So they use, they build up this Eureka server as a, like a address book or the, a, a new DNS right, to map the service name to a IP address. So the mechanisms like this, when the service provider start up, the service provider will find out the Eureka server and then tell the Eureka server, hey, I am a provider, my name is XYZ and my location is this IP, right? So if there are multiple instances of provider, each of them will tell them, hey, I am service provider, my IP is this, and then the other instance have a different IP. So Eureka server collects all three IP address from the same provider. So when the service consumer need to make a call to provider, Right, they will ask Eureka server, um, hey, I need to call provider, please um, give me the location of the provider. And then Eureka server will return all the free location of the provider. And then consumer can call any one of them. Right. And they also, I think they also built a client side load balancing right, to help them to determine which instance to call. But um, yeah, so that's the basic mechanism of um, Eureka Server. And then that's the same way the Spring Cloud Discovery work. So you need to um, provision a Spring Cloud Eureka Server or Spring Cloud Discovery Server, right? And then your consumer, your provider need to be able to find the location of the server. It can be done by um, 
specifying that in the property file, right? So when the consumer or provider puts trap, it will register itself to the Eureka server. And then when it need to make a call to a remote service, Eureka server will be able to respond to the actual location of the service. And then the developer of consumer doesn't to know or configure the location of the provider. The developer just need the provider name, right? You can hard code it or you can put it in the property file. Um, and then in runtime, the Eureka server will be able to send the actual location to the consumer, right? That's the Eureka server. That's um, Spring Cloud Discovery. But if you're familiar with Kubernetes, no, Kubernetes actually simplified this a lot um, by using the service name. So Kubernetes, when you deploy an application to Kubernetes, um, like when you deploy the provider to Kubernetes, um, you can deploy a service, can be internal service or external service. Right? And then a service come, comes with a name. And then you just need to provide the name to the consumer. And the consumer can call that um, service effectively without knowing the location. Right? So Kubernetes actually simplified this a lot. You don't need um, the Eureka server for that. You don't need to stand up a Eureka server and you don't need to manage the availability, the scalability of the Eureka server. Don't forget, if the Eureka server is crashed, then all of your servers cannot be called. There's no remote call, right? Because you don't know the location of the provider. Obviously, you can have multiple instances of Eureka server. I'm just saying, if the Eureka server is down, all the services will be um, affected. But with um, Kubernetes, it is, you know, it is um, done you know, out of the box. You don't need to configure anything for that. So for your Spring Boot applications, you have a consumer, you have a provider running on Kubernetes. You don't need to set up a Eureka server. Just use the native service name for that. That's um, simplify the deployment and the development a lot. Right. And don't forget, I mention again, your applications may have mix of programming language. You may have a lot of Spring Boot applications, but you may also have some other languages like Node.js or database, right? And you want to use the same mechanism to integrate all of them. So with Spring Cloud, it's only for Spring, obviously. Uh, there are some um, library for Node.js. I've seen that, but it's not really um, actively um, updated. So majority will be also Spring. So if you use Spring Cloud, um, limited to Spring. But if you use Kubernetes, the native service discovery, can use it for all the programming language. It's programming language in our state. Okay. Um, yeah, this is just the screen capture of the Eureka server um, to show you is, yeah, essentially it's like a dress book um, mapping the service name or application's name to the location. You can map to a IP or a URL using domain name. Okay. And then um, Spring Cloud Config. So Netflix built the config server to solve these configuration management issues. So they had lots of microservices, right? And sometimes they want to update the configuration. For example, a feature flag. They want to update a feature flag. They want to enable a feature but they do not want to reboot, restart the application. 
So that's why they build this config server to allow them to inject the configuration to the application's context without restarting the um, application. Right? How did they do that? So they are microservices. All of the microservices comes with a special endpoint called refetch. If you need to update the configuration, um, you first you will put the configuration into a deep repository, right? And then if you need to change the configuration, for example, the feature flag is mentioned, you update the git commit and change the configuration in the git repo. And then second, you um, reach out to this endpoint of the microservice. And then this service will um, try to get the update from the config server. And the config server will get the latest configuration from the Git repo, right? And then this microservice one will um, reload the context without rebooting, without restarting, without the need of restarting, right? So it is um, very quick. There's no impact, there's no runtime, right? And then you may need to change, you may, need, you may need to change the feature flag or some other configuration um, for multiple services at the same time. Maybe there is some dependency between microservice one, two, three, and then you need to change that configuration all at once. So they also have this concept called cloud bus, right? Um, if the application subscribe to this cloud bus, and when you make a request to the refresh endpoint, it will also send a notification to cloud bus, right? And then all of the microservices will be notified. And then all of them will try to get an update from the config server at the same time. So all of them will be updated um, simultaneously. All right, so that's the mechanism of Spring Cloud config server. Now let's talk about Kubernetes. Um, in Kubernetes, as you can imagine, it's also not necessary to have this config server. Um, and there's also benefit. Again, Spring Cloud config server is for Spring. Um, if you have another Google languages like the JS application, you may not be able to use the Spring Cloud config server. So if you're running all of them on Kubernetes, use the Kubernetes native way of configuration. Um, in Kubernetes, you may have a config map or secret. So config map is for configuration. Um, secrets is also kind of configuration, but um, it is for credentials, like the username, password, private key, that kind of thing, where you, you don't want to store as a clear task. And then we use secrets for storing that. But both of them are um, configuration. So um, my recommendation is to use config map and secrets for that. Um, but how to do it, how to, how to use the same mechanism like this cloud config server? For example, how can I update multiple servers at once? Or how can I update the configuration of an application without the need of restarting. Um, in Kubernetes, it is also possible. So um, how to do it? There's a there so you can you can um, do it using the Spring Cloud Kubernetes configuration watcher. Let me show you as well. Yeah. 
So for your spring application, you can simply use the config map to, for externalizing your configuration. It's that easy. Um, how to do it? It is um, first thing. Let me show you a simple one first. So I have a field config map here. Let me show you this. This is one of the config map. So you can externalize your um, applications configuration into your config map. And then you will bind this config map into your deployment. Right? You can bind it, you can mount this configuration into a uh, path so that your application can load the configuration from a specific path. Or you can do it using the environment like that. So there's a few ways to do that. Um, so yeah, if you need to do the um, Spring Cloud config similar ways, you use the Spring Cloud Cube, that is configuration watcher. So with this specific um, library, we allow you to um, reload the configuration without the need of restarting the applications on the Kubernetes. With this, when the content of the config map or the content of a secret is changed, right, you, it will notify your application and then it will run the refresh endpoint and then load the con uh, refresh the context without restarting the application, right? So similar to the Spring Cloud config server. Okay, another one, Spring Cloud history. Um, it is a circuit breaker. Why did Netflix do this? Because they have a lot of servers, and then the servers, uh, this, what, they, what, they, what did they say? They said there's no servers, it's an island, meaning all of the servers, they are interconnected, they're integrated. So you can imagine a one, there's this one request sending, right? to Netflix and then at the back you trigger a series of services right from A to B to C to D to E right so there's lots of um, dependency you can imagine if there's a for example the upstream service is not is not responding the problem is the the other service that depends on the upstream will wait until time out, usually. Um, for example, if it is a HTTP REST uh, request, um, by default, it will wait for 30 seconds. If no response from the provider in 30 seconds, then there will be a time out exception. The problem is that this time out exception actually um, will utilize or the weight, the weight for the time of exception is actually um, need to utilize the thread pool. There's a, the thread pool in a, for example, Tomcat container is very limited. So if you have a lot of requests stuck there in the thread pool waiting for the response from a already crashed provider, very quickly, your threat pool will be fully utilized, and then you need, and then your applications cannot take up more requests. Meaning, you may need to scale out. Right, the only way to accept more requests is to scale out that um, application, increase the number of instances. But then, because the upstream is not responding. No matter how many instances you scale out, right, you will fully utilize the thread pool, and then the whole system 
will be stuck. Um, and uh, that's not what you want to see. That's why Netflix built this circuit breaker to protect the, um, the other services from cascade failure. They don't want the failure from an say from a from a um, surface right be impact uh, to, to impact other surfaces. That's why they build this circuit breaker. The mechanism is um, quite simple. Instead of waiting, instead of waiting for a time of exception, um, because they they also integrate this circuit breaker with the Eureka server. The Eureka server actually aware of the um, healthiness of the um, all of the instance of different services. So Eureka server has um, got an idea of um, the healthiness of a particular service. So circuit breaker will also, you know, instead of waiting for timeout, because we are aware of the readiness of the healthiness of the um, provider, for example, um, it will not um, wait for the exception. Instead, if there's no healthy instant um, for the provider, the circuit breaker will open the circuit, meaning they will call, will not send any request to the provider. It will then run a fallback command. So you can use the fallback to um, degrade your service gracefully, right? Instead of throwing an exception, right? For example, um, if if the service um, got affected, is the searching service, right? Out for some reason in the Netflix scenario, there's a search function allow the end customer to search a movie, for example. Instead, if the searching is not working, instead of, um, you know, uh, instead of just throwing an error message, what they can do is to um, return the top 10 movies, right? You cannot search, yeah, sorry, but there, this is the, these are the top 10 movies um, past week. Maybe you'll be interested, something like that, right? So that, that's what we call the um, wastefully degrade. And um, that's history circuit breaker. So in Kubernetes, you don't need the history. Again, history is only for um, you know, Spring Boot. If you want to work with other program language um, in Kubernetes, you can actually use um, the surface mesh on Kubernetes. Um, one of the most popular surface mesh is um, Istio, and I'm going to cover a little bit of Istio just after this. Um, then the fourth framework from Spring Cloud I want to um, talk about is the Spring Cloud Trace. Um, again, as you can imagine, the number of services in Netflix, a lot, and then lots of them depends on each other. So if if there's a one of the service um, spending too long on a request, and then you want to troubleshoot uh, because the, the the it is so complicated, and then layer by layer, and then there's a stream of request response. It will be very difficult to troubleshoot without um, what we call distributed tracing. So Netflix built this um, to help you collect the metrics from each of the services and build the, and allow you to visualize the request. Um, for example, allow you to visualize the amount of time the request has been spent on service one, two, three, four, right? Specifically, so let's say service one, spent 1.142 second but then actually in that 1.142 second about one second spent by surface two right and then actually 300 milliseconds spent by surface three right something like that allow you to determine um, where's the bottleneck 
Right. It's very good, very useful for troubleshooting, very useful for you to um, have a performance tuning. Right. Again, this is the Spring Cloud version. In Kubernetes, you can also use um, Surface Mesh for that. Next, I'm going to talk about Surface Mesh. Um, Istio. So Istio is the most popular Surface Mesh on the Kubernetes ecosystem. There's some other, um, but today we're not going to talk about Istio. So as you can see in the diagram, um, the Surface Mesh or the Istio Surface Mesh come with two different planes, the control plane and the data plane. And then the gray boxes are the surface or your application, your Spring Boot applications actually surface. So is to use the container, um, one of the container mechanism to build up the data plane, which is, you know, in, in Kubernetes, you can define port and then you can define multiple containers in a pod. And if you have one more than one container in a pod, right, that means the container will be running in the same worker node that's guaranteed by Kubernetes. And then the container A and container B can talk to each other by using localhost, right? It's very similar to the both um, service, the both container running in the same environment. So that's, that's the design of Kubernetes port and container. So is to use this mechanism, right, to inject the data plane to sit together with the container, with your application and then allow you as an applications developer you can offload lots of tasks to the data plane for example as i mentioned earlier distributed tracing for example um, circuit breaking for example surface discovery something like that so you can offload all of these to the surface policy or to the data plane, right? So to your applications development will be simpler and it works with all languages, work with anything you can run on Kubernetes, not just Spring, but Node.js, Python, etc. right? So the features that are supported by Surface Mesh or Istio include, as you can see, here, um, surface authentication. Um, so allow you to authenticate the consumer service or the provider service. Um, we can also enforce the use of mutual TLS so that the traffic between the services are encrypted and then the request response I mean the um, service provider and consumer they are mutual authenticated, not just protecting the client, but also protecting the server. Low balancing, um, Tamo, we try as mentioned, circuit, circuit breaker, so also features of the service policy. Um, connection pool sizing, fine grained routing, right? You can do routing as well, meaning if your service need to talk to another service, you can use the service policy um, to configure the traffic management to route to different location based on the defined policy. Telemetry, um, request tracing, right? As mentioned, if you want to do troubleshooting, you can use the request tracing features from the service policy. So very similar to distributed tracing. For all the request response that gone through the policy, and all the request response have to go through the policy if you installed the, the data plane. Right? That's the guarantee. You cannot send a request to the 
your sprinkled applications directly without going through the policy. Right? So that's provide you the security and then you can define all these policy in this data plane. So the request tracing, um, for request tracing, the auto request response goes through the policy and then the policy service will provide the uh, or instrument the request and response and they inject the um, header if it is a for example HTTP request right and then send all these metrics to the um, to a centralized location and then you'll be able to see the distributed tracing and I'm, I'm going to show you in, uh, very quickly and then for injection right you can also do that with certain ports as well um, for example you can imagine in a um, user accepting test right you can actually do this um, for the injection using the service policy. You can, for example, slow down the provider service to see the behavior of the consumer, right? Um, something like that, right? And then um, quite lots of features that you can utilize as well. Um, for example, weight limiting. Um, yeah, right. So that's, uh, that's what is to can provide but if you run kubernetes if you use kubernetes on google say gke or if you use enfos um for example for on-premise data center or you want to run gke on aws um you can actually use instead of istio you can use the enfos surface mesh why do you want to use Anthos? Because first, it is supported by Google, obviously, under the brand uh, of Anthos. And then it is managed. The control plane, the data plane in Anthos Surface Mesh are managed by Google instead of managed by yourself. You, um, you can imagine if the, you need to upgrade the Istio version if you use the open source Istio, you need to do it by yourself. Um, if you use the managed control plane from Anthos Surface Mesh, it is managed by Google, obviously. Um, certificate Authority is also managed by Google. Um, if you use open source Istio, Istio you need to have your own um, sit down open source, and then you need to manage the set rotation, key rotation, Etc. Right, um, but as in Google, it is unmanaged. There, there is a managed CA that you can use, so you don't need to worry about the such rotation. Um, and then it is integrated with the Google console, with the security dashboard, with the SRE dashboard, so you can easily define the SLO, SLI using the SRE dashboard for the services running on Kubernetes. And then there's some other enterprise features. For example, you can integrate the virtual machine. For, like you have sprinkled applications running on Kubernetes, but there is a database, for example, running on virtual machine. Right? You can actually add the virtual machine to the same service mesh. Right? So your sprinkled applications can um, call the database using exactly the same service mesh mechanism and don't need to worry about where, where the location of the surface is. Um, yeah, so why not I show you a little bit of the surface match. So, <clears throat> I think we're running out of time, so if you search ASM here, you see surface match. And then, as you can see, this is the Surface Mesh console. And you can filter 
the list here, my namespace. I think I have some demo applications on the default namespace. As you can see, these are all of the services that are running on my Kubernetes cluster. And for example, if I click the front end service here, you'll be able to see or visualize the, the services depends on the front end and then the services that the front end depends on. As you can see, there's a load generator sending traffic to the front end and then front end will send the request to balance reader, contest, and write, et cetera. So this about you to uh, have, a, have a view of the services dependency. And then all of the, you know, the metrics, like the number of requests, the CPU utilization, that can be easily found here in this dashboard. And then some other thing, like the healthiness of the services, Right, you can define SLO as mentioned. Right, you can define SLO, and then this diagram, this table allows you to see the remaining budget for the particular service. So as you can see, um, this uh, funded service, I have ninety percent availability per calendar week, and then I, have, I still have ninety nine point nine percent of our budget to use. Right. And then if you want to see some distributed tracing, you can click that matrix. And this page will provide you a more detailed view of the matrix, like request per second, error rate, latency, etc. And then you can click this view traces that show you the distributed tracing view um, equivalent to Istio the Jaeger um, view, but again, this one, we don't need to manage Jaeger. Yeah, so this is also for the front end, um, but just pick one of them. Then you can be able to see the request actually gone through a few services and you can see the amount of time that this request spent on the service. And then this provides a very detailed view of the request. Right. Again, very good for troubleshooting or performance tuning. Okay. Um, thing for the time, a pause here to take question. Um, see if anyone got any question here. Hello. Um, so far, um, there's no question that's coming in via the Q&A. So uh, for everyone on the live stream, if you have any questions for Derek, uh, do uh, leave a comment and then um, we'll go through the questions uh, one at a time um okay so um in the meantime while we are waiting uh Derek, if you don't mind um i got uh some questions that maybe you can uh can take that and then uh we'll see if anybody comes up with questions in the sure. chat you can go there um okay so um just wondering regarding the um the entos service uh match right we uh like we see the uh, metrics and traces and everything that's all automatically gathered so um like do you need to um instrument the uh java application at all like like it's essentially like there's no need to import any dependency or anything like mm. the moment we use this uh and toss like everything just comes out of the box like magic um very good question so um if you use Spring Boot and you use, you can use Spring Cloud Trace for that, as mentioned. To use Spring Cloud Trace, you need to add the dependency, like um, um, I think it is called Trace. Right here, Trace, uh, Sleuth. 
that's the one for Spring Cloud. But if you run the application on Kubernetes with these two, you don't need this dependency, right? Because this will not be handled by the application, it will be handled by the proxy, or we, uh, we call them sidecar proxy, sidecar, because it is like a sidecar of that of your application. So again, a lot of the task can be offloaded to the proxy, right? So that your application doesn't need to handle that, for example, service authentication, and for example, request tracing. So for Spring Boot developer, you don't need to add Spring Cloud Sleuth to, as a dependency of your application. You don't need that. And then you can configure through the service mesh control plane, you can configure, you can tell the sidecar policy or service policy to instrument all the request response and then send the, um, and then send, for example, just 10% of the metrics, right, to the um, repository. I, I don't want to store 100% because it will be um, very expensive. I just want to store 1% or 10%, right? You can, you can configure this policy through the control plane and then control plane will help you to update the data plane or the service policy. So yeah, to answer your question, um, as an app developer, you don't need to do anything um, in the application. Uh, that's nice to know. Um, so also another question. I mean, um, I've read Istio like quite a while back. Uh, that time I was like, uh, considering uh, considering trying out Istio for one of my personal projects just to just to learn what the project is about. Um, and one of the things that they were mentioning is about tracing. Um, the the they they say they do have uh capability to capture traces, but then, um there was a segment that i read then where like if you want to trace across multiple components like they want to say like this trace like originated from like some front-end service and you want to tie it all together to some back-end service to database or something uh it might not be able to capture that uh because like you need to add in some metadata is that is that now change or or uh, yes yeah, like... change it's change um, as you can see, this view I just showed you. Yeah, I didn't do anything with the application. I didn't configure anything. What I did, what I did is just inject the sidecar proxy to, the, to this namespace. Um, by a, a, a very simple command, inject the sidecar proxy. I mean, um, specify, run the command for that namespace, and then deploy your applications. Then you'll see the container uh, will be in, there will be two containers in each port, and then if you describe, for example, this. You'll see the container. There are two containers. The first one is your application, and then the other one is the Istio proxy. So the proxy cycle automatically injected to stick with your application. And then um, because the mention is always there, if your applications die, the cycle die. Or if the cycle die, your applications die. That to make sure your application will not be alone. And then when your application is up, there is a proxy to help you handle all the requests and response. And again, there is no way, there's no way to send a request to the service, to your application without going through the sidecar, right? It is locked. If you need to reach to the service, please send a request to this proxy, right? Um, so, um, it's like a, a a guard. It's like bodyguard, right? It will help you handle all these 
all these features of application tracing. So yeah, so um, the application doesn't need to handle anything um, like the metadata. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, let me try to understand that. Okay, I, I do understand about the part about the like all the requests going to a proxy and that's why the proxy kind of knows uh what request goes where. Okay, but I guess I guess it's a kind of new thing where now they now they actually know where this request came from in the past. Because like, I think there was a period of time when they, uh this like is unable to get the full tray, the word picture you're showing right now. Um that was what uh the istio documentation was saying but that was like two years back so i don't know what changed along the way yeah so i guess the good thing that now um like with, with the magic of this like service mesh like all this is like all automatically added so uh, uh let's work for the developer's perspective but i do want i do wonder like how, how do they do that matching when in the past they said that they is difficult for them to do so Mm, uh, uh, okay, I, I guess um, so. The the proxy will they they, they generate some special header, right? Um, like as you can see here, I think this is the request ID that generated by a proxy, and then this ID will be forward um, together with the request, right? So the other proxy, when they receive a request. They will check do you have this um x request id if if yes then the proxy will also copy this x request id to the response or if the request need to forward to another service the proxy will make sure this request id um, got forward to the other request to the other service so yeah so using this kind of mechanism to make sure um everything can be traced um, so yeah so that, that's the that's the unique request id that um, got uh, injected to the all the request and response okay hmm thanks for that um yeah i i'm not too familiar with the uh this tracing internals i mean i do get um uh, about the special header uh i i had to deal with it uh, when i was like trying to use uh jaeger jaeger is the other i guess uh the open source version of these tracing tools um and yes they were mentioning about the special header that you know uh gets the request id but yeah i probably need to go and read up more on on this as well like to fully understand the magic okay um so so far i've checked comments there isn't um much question coming in uh i guess we'll just take uh, one more question from me and then if there's still no one coming in then we'll just add the end the, the stream there uh so i have another question regarding uh build pack um so yeah. i was just wondering um like in your in your work in your line of work um like uh what's the take up rate of the uh of these kind of tools uh like like build pack and etc because from what i understand um at least for some companies some companies will just like okay uh we are working with container that means we are working with docker container d and that's it like having all these extra tools means extra layers to debug if there's uh, any issue uh because like uh like as we are uh, as we kind of know like every tool essentially is just another layer to kind of debug if there's issue that come up because there's no guarantee that a tool is 100 percent uh bug free uh all tools have certain bugs and it's just whether you encounter them or not <laughs> eventually one one will but it's just a matter of chance so like do you know like what's the take up rate of like tools like maybe uh build pack um and maybe another tool i can think of off the top of my head is like something like scaffold which probably can hmm. also integrate with build pack so yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. scaffold also integrate with build pack. um yeah very good question um 
I think it depends on the use cases. I've seen customer that they use a lot of build pack when they develop new application, right? Because the build pack, when you use build pack, right, there are a bit of assumption. Um, for example, it's assuming you will be okay to use the base image provided by build pack. Some application, they have very specific requirement on the container image. For example, they need a specific agent being installed in that um, container image. It then this is not a good good use case um, for the pack. This I've seen this when customer have um, um, they they want to migrate applications from the old infrastructure like a virtual machine to Kubernetes. Then very likely they will not use build pack for that because the application has been built for years, right? And then the applications may not be suitable to use build pack. But um, for customer building new application using Spring Boot or any other framework uh, supported by build pack is, yeah, they, 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 they use um, more build pack um, for that because the application um, is more cloud native um, than they're, um, they, 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 they're okay to leverage build pack um, for that. So I say it really depends on the use cases. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of want to kind of gauge like where the industry is in terms of the yeah, acceptance of this, um, this uh, tooling because like you know there's a lot of tooling uh, out there. Just like I do wonder, um, the tooling can only survive if there are users. So it'll be good to kind of have a rough gauge of um, which tool will continue to be worked on and and whether we can like take up and try out those tools for our own projects, use cases, or in our own companies. Yeah. So um, and yeah. then just one more thing, um, the build pack. I think is 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 new to the Kubernetes ecosystem. But the build pack itself is not new. Uh, as I mentioned, Heroku, um, the 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 developer who's used Heroku or the developer who used Cloud Foundry, right? Build pack is um, one of the major way for them to build and run the services. So it is the build pack being in this um, you know, in the performance service for years, and then. Um, it became a standalone project, I think, two years back. And then um, since then, the developer from the Kubernetes ecosystem, um, they can also leverage with it. So um, it is new or newer in the Kubernetes ecosystem, but there have been lots of um, client um, using Willpack from on another platform um, for many years already. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, that's 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 a good thing to to take note of. Yeah, I yeah, maybe maybe one day I will I will myself will go and try it. <laughs> try uh, like, it. I, I, yeah, I haven't tried it because like ah uh, yeah, Docker Docker is good enough, right? <laughs> but yeah, I probably might try. It. I mean, if I ever go Java, I don't want to deal with java and the memory stuff and everything the memory calculator uh really does seem to be quite a useful thing like i don't want to do the memory calculation for a java yeah. app yes okay uh there's no questions coming into the the chat um so i guess we'll just end the this webinar here so once again uh thanks derek for your share for your sharing uh, it should be uh it's quite useful for it, but for me for sure because like build pack, um, it's rare for me to see people present on it. This like the second or third time so far in my life. Okay. I need like to see something three or four times before like okay maybe I'll try it. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, so it's good to see these tools and uh and 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 for once to see someone actually using Entos, uh, Entos demo is super rare at least here right now. Um, so it's good to see like what what Entos has to offer. Uh, in terms of this space and service mesh and everything. So yeah, thanks Derek for your time. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll put you to the backstage. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so, uh, with that, uh, that was Derek sharing on uh, Spring Boot apps on Kubernetes. Uh, so, with that, we come to the end of the webinar. But before we end, um, uh, as usual, um, if anyone out there is uh, interested to speak on any like Google Cloud Platform uh, related topics, or anything Google related, just um, go to that link down there and um, just sign up and then we'll like uh, pair you up with the relevant communities. Uh, if anything Google Cloud related, uh, you'll probably have that chance to go speak on this uh, uh, webinar sessions on Google Cloud Platform, uh, GDG Cloud Singapore uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and as usual, if you like the content, uh, if you like today's content, technical content, uh, if you prefer more technical depths, uh, just leave a like uh, and comment down in this video. Uh, and if you want to, uh, uh, like, how call it, um, get the first news about uh, what uh, webinars is going to happen, uh, just follow any of the uh, social media links down here so that's facebook slack uh meetup and gdg sites uh slack is particularly active right now because um not sure if anybody on stream uh knows uh right now uh the g how do i call it modular gcp campaign is happening right now so um I think now is kind of the last week and it's kind of an extension. So for those on stream right now, um, and if you are happening to, if you happen to participate in the campaign, uh, do finish up your campaigns and uh, send send the, uh, what you have accomplished so that you can, you can get all those swags. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the end. Thank you. See you next time. Bye.